What's up, everybody? Today, we're going to go through Brian Koberger's full and complete, almost full and complete alibi. More could be coming later. How is that possible? We'll discuss that. And the reason we'll talk about whether or not it is even more or complete is we're going to compare it to his initial alibi, his initial excuse, his initial whereabouts that he said in a prior motion that has now been expanded on and additional details and corroboration have been added because that is what the state asked for. That is what the defense needs to provide. And we're going to talk about whether or not they did provide it. Did they provide it appropriately? Will the judge allow this? And will he allow more to come in later? And then at the end, we're going to just do a quick snippet on already how the news and the media are projecting or explaining or talking about this alibi, which should be a surprise to exactly no one. So thanks everybody for joining me. Hit that like button, subscribe, and let's jump into it. All right. So in order for us to even get to know and understand what's different about the alibi that was just filed uh, late yesterday, which was literally at the buzzer by his defense team. But again, it really doesn't matter. Um, if he has evidence that proves he is innocent or proves he was not there, the judge is going to let it in. Spoiler alert. We've been saying this from the jump. And that's why everybody was getting all up in arms on the first date his alibi was due. And said, I get it. And, you know, I get that he's got to provide something, but it doesn't mean it can't change. It doesn't mean things can't be added to it. And that's what's continued to happen already in this case. And don't be surprised if it does continue to happen. There's even a hint about it happening in the most recent motion, notifying us of more corroborating evidence for his alibi. But first, let's go all the way back to August of 2023 to look into and discuss what the initial claims were. We remember everybody's been talking about it from day one. He was out driving around. That's what we knew. That's basically what they said. So we're going to read through it, see what detail they provide and what they say might be coming later. And we'll compare it to what's actually been explained now in his current alibi. Mr. Koberger has long had a habit of going for drives alone. Often he would go for drives at night. He did so late on November 12th and into November 13th, 2022. Mr. Koberger is not claiming to be at a specific location at a specific time. At this time, there is not a specific witness to say precisely where Mr. Koberger was at each moment of the hours between the late night of November 12th and early November 13th. So that's the first thing I want everybody to remember. At that point, there was not a specific witness that um, can say where he was. So let's write it down. Let's keep track of some things here and compare it. He was out driving during the late night and early morning hours of November 12th and 13th. Okay, we got that third time. Counsel for Mr. Koberger is aware that case law broadens the definition of alibi with the statutory requirement of a specific location to more broadly include disclosure of information that tends to state the person claiming the alibi was at a place other than the location of an offense. Mr. Koberger has complied to the extent possible at this time. And there's a lot of at this time in this document and maybe even in the next one. Corroboration, very important, of Brian Koberger not being at 1122 Kings Road may be brought out through cross-examination of the state's witnesses, and it still may. At this time, Mr. Koberger cannot be more specific about the possible witnesses and exactly what they will say. Again, for a reminder, anybody joining us, this is his prior alibi notice back in August of 23. Um, the defense has been hampered by the state's own choices. We'll see if that's a common theme. Had the state moved forward with the preliminary hearing, the defense would have had the opportunity to develop testimony through cross-examination and witness presentation, which they still will, and no judge would ever force them to say what's going to come out in cross-examination. Instead, the defense has only received, on July 27, 2023, which is just a few days before this was filed, a copy of the testimony of the state chose to elicit. Review of such is underway. So. They hadn't reviewed all the grand jury testimony at this point in August, but guess what? What we're going to read that was filed on April 17th yesterday, they have had an opportunity to read all this and we'll see what's changed. The defense had to obtain investigative material from the state's investigative counterparts, the FBI, through an order compelling the state to provide such materials. The state made draft disclosures just two weeks ago. 
The sufficiency of these disclosures is currently being analyzed. So once again, they were analyzing more information as they gave this bare bones alibi almost a year ago. Corroboration of Brian Koberger not being at 1122 King may be brought out through expert witness presentation. Analysis is underway. So let's make there. Did they get an expert? Most of you that have seen the alibi by now know the answer to this, but we're going to get to it. The defense has been diligently working to analyze relevant discovery materials and conduct its own investigation. Notably, the defense had to obtain a court order to receive relevant doc or discovery materials that delay hampers the defense investigation. So way back then in August, the defense was still having to file motions to compel to get relevant evidence that helps corroborate their alibi. That's at least what they're saying. Motions to compel, discovery for alibi info. Write that down. Okay. The right to offer the testimony of witnesses and to compel their attendance if necessary is in plain terms, the right to present a defense, the right to present the defendant's version of the facts, as well as the prosecutions to the jury. So it may decide where the truth lies. Just as an accused has the right to confront the prosecution's witness for the purpose of challenging their testimony, he has the right to present his own witnesses to establish a defense. Okay. Yeah. Nobody's going to argue with that. The defense acknowledges a vast amount of discovery has been provided. Discovery is received on a nearly weekly basis. So we'll see if we're done with that, right? They talked about a bunch of stuff they just got or hadn't gotten yet that they had to analyze that they didn't get to at the point that they were giving this bare bones alibi, but they've got a lot more now, obviously, almost a year later. The defense reviews and acts on the discovery as quickly as possible, including making appropriate supplemental requests for discovery, meaning additional requests. Like you get something, you look through and you're like, this isn't everything, or this points me to that. I need to go get that now. So then they're having to go ask for that. If the state doesn't give it, they have to file another motion to compel and force the state to turn it over. The state's motion is an attempt to force the defense to open its work product files and let the state peek inside. That's not necessarily true. They just have to file an alibi defense, which again, they've done yesterday. Uh, the defense has, has stated all that can firmly be stated at this time. This is not a trial by ambush from the defense. This is the defense requesting information as quickly as possible, yet in some instances face the delay of requesting a court order to obtain information, meaning a court order from a motion to compel, meaning they told the state, we need X. State says no. They say, judge, we need X. Judge says, state, you have to give them X. And now there's been this big delay. The state continually uses those opportunities to attempt to force a waiver speedy trial. We already know that happened. That is a decision left to Mr. Koberger. He was out driving alone. That's basically all we get right here in this August motion. Corroborating evidence may come from cross-examination, may come from presentation of experts. He is aware of and will comply with his continuing duty to disclose information. The court may exempt Mr. Koberger from further inquiry. Mr. Koberger requests such an exception at this time. Continued inquiry at this juncture delves into his case investigation as well as protected work product. In support of the exemption, Mr. Koberger is prepared to provide further detail ex parte, which he never had to do because the judge rightfully extended it and allowed them to continue looking through discovery that was not necessarily timely provided by the state. Okay? So I wanted to show that first so we could all be on the same page when we get to his current alibi. But before we get there, let's get to some questions. Yes, Cerebellum, everybody was sending me this last night, which I get it. I get it. Um, and we're here. Welcome to Amy and Chad. Love when the new members join us. Nick, I'm going to hold on your question till we read some more of this alibi, but Netwoman popped in. I'm going to be part of the rewatch crew, but I've been wondering this for a while. How can defendants be required to give an alibi statement when they want to invoke their right to remain silent? Thank you again for all you do for us. That's very interesting, right? To give their alibi to say, okay, I was here, but how do you prove that without testifying in certain situations, which this is going to be a huge part of my analysis of his current alibi. And since Netwoman asked it off the top, let's keep this question in our mind as we read through a couple pages of this document. It's very short, but we're going to read through it and really dissect it together to see if it's anything different and how they're going to prove this. Spoiler alert, they have an expert. The expert has gone through information. So they're going to prove some of it by an expert, but in the back of your mind, think about this. How are they going to prove this, all of this with context and that it is, in fact, an alibi without Brian Koberger testifying? That's the question here. Yeah. 
All right, let's jump into it. Comes now. Brian C. Koberger, by and through his attorney of record, Ann C. Taylor, public defender, and hereby files a supplemental response to the demand for alibi and compliance with Idaho Code 19519 and Idaho Criminal Rule 12.1. Mr. Koberger moved to Pullman, Washington, sorry, Pullman, Washington in June of 2022. Okay, about five months before the crimes occurred. As an avid runner and hiker, he explored many areas of Palouse. I'm sure I'm going to pronounce things wrong, especially with some W words coming up. But right from the jump there, how are they going to prove that he is an avid runner and hiker? Maybe from his sister, maybe from his dad, maybe from some family members or friends. Okay. He explored many areas of Palouse. How are they going to prove that without his testimony? Maybe parents, friends, but if he did this alone, which is what they're going to say was happening, obviously in November, how would they know this without potentially hearsay? And if they only know he was a runner because he told them, or they only know he explored because he told them that's potentially inadmissible hearsay. So how do they get into this without Coburg or testifying of note? He explored, and just in case you're just jumping in, this is the actual alibi they filed yesterday. We've already compared the alibi from August. This is the one from yesterday. Of note, he explored Wawawai Park in July of 2022, and this became a favorite location. How do they prove this? Well, I'm assuming that he's got cell phone pictures, texts, videos of Wawawai Park in July that they can actually prove when he took those pictures. And maybe he went back there over and over again, as can be proven by some cell phone data to show he would go there all the time. But was it his favorite? Was it a favorite? How do you get context like that without asking the person who went there? After the school year began, Mr. Koberger was busy with classes and work at Washington State University and his running and hiking decreased but did not stop. So my guess is they have some corroborating evidence that he continued to run or hike, Apple Watch, you know, phone, whatever. Instead, his nighttime drives increased. So we already know from the previous alibi, he liked to drive around at night alone. This is supported by data from Mr. Koberger's phone, showing him in the countryside late at night and or in the early morning on several occasions. So... I don't know. I'm not from Idaho or Washington, but saying things like in the countryside, there are other words and phrases used in this document that make me think maybe they're going to argue based on his phone data and with their expert that from time to time he would drive to areas where there was no cell phone service and there would be a disconnection completely with the towers. And maybe his phone wasn't necessarily powered off all of these times, but just disconnected. I don't know. The phone data includes numerous photographs taken on several different late evenings and early mornings, including in November, depicting the night sky. Very possible. Take a good picture of the night sky, maybe the moon and stars, as we'll hear referenced later. And again, if you do this with your cell phone, you can track and prove the date and time and location you were taking these pictures. And you can corroborate that you did, in fact, take these light night drives. And you can obviously prove numerous photographs by showing numerous photographs. Mr. Koberger was out driving in the early morning hours of November 13th, as he often did, to hike and run and or see the moon and stars. There's the moon and stars. That, again, we'll hear later. But this is a weird phrase. This is weird phrasing to me. He was out driving in the early morning, as he often did to hike and run. So again, to explain why he started driving instead of hiking and running, could he not get to the beautiful areas by hike or run in time, so he had to drive, okay, Was it done for health reasons or activity reasons? Because driving obviously doesn't take that over. Um, Clear your head reasons, but guess what? How do we get any of those answers unless Brian Koberger testifies? 
He drove throughout the area south of Pullman, Washington, west of Moscow, Idaho, including Wawawai Park. So another reason they're giving specific locations is to show how time-wise, location-wise, phone, car, this can fit into a lot of the evidence the state has. Pinging off certain cell phone towers. Are any of these places close enough to potentially ping to a tower that is a tower near the crime scene at 1122 Kings Road? Are they starting to create reasons, excuses, whatever you want to call them, as to why he may have pinged near the house on other dates and times? They have a lot of information now that they can potentially use. Margaret, if he had an alibi, why was he arrested? So just because you have an alibi doesn't mean the state has to buy your alibi. They don't have to believe it. The jury might, but law enforcement can say, nope, there's no other corroborating evidence for your alibi. We don't believe you. We have X, Y, and Z proving that we think you did it. There's probable cause and you still get arrested. There's some really good alibis that have really good evidence that the state still doesn't agree with. And so they charge you, arrest you, continue going forward. Thank you to... Hi, it's not real. And Francis for gifting some memberships here. All right. Partial corroboration. So not full corroboration, but partial. And again, this was filed literally yesterday. I think like at after five o'clock their time. Mr. Koberger intends to offer testimony of Cy Ray, CSLI expert, cell tower, cell phone, and other radio frequency his CV, meaning his resume, is attached. We can take a look at that. To show that Brian Koberger's mobile device was south of Pullman, Washington, and west of Moscow, Idaho, on November 13th, 2022. So at some point, he says, or they're working this in with where the state says he was. And my guess is we're going to have a some kind of a layover where it's like all the all the points and dots where the state says he is and then where the defense says and how this could still all fit into the defense's story and theme. Uh, his mobile device did not travel east on Moscow Pullman Highway in the early hours of November 13th and thus could not be the vehicle captured <coughs> on video along the Moscow Pullman Highway near Floyd's Cannabis Shop which is a piece of evidence, a video clip the state plans to use when they are plotting where Koberger's car was on his way to the house or from the house to commit this crime. And guess what? Here's an interesting thought, right? They could be absolutely right, the defense, that that's not Koberger's car and they can prove it. But he still could have been the one that drove over there, right? So that's what's interesting and why the state always has to be incredibly careful at the evidence they present. Because if one of your dominoes fall, or you're like, he drove here, 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 here to get to the house, he could have just done this, but you know, we have some video that we think he did this. But if the de defense can pick out this one part and make that one domino fall and start, start the chain reaction from there, will the jury start to question everything? Should the jury start to question everything? I'm of the impression that the state better be right and better be sure before they present a piece of evidence saying it proves a man's guilt. So it seems like, and again, they didn't hammer every point by, made by the state, but they did a video clip near Floyd's cannabis shop. Now, does the state have to present that evidence at trial? No. So it's give and take here. The defense knows a lot of evidence the state's going to use and can you know, create this alibi, as people say. But the state can also now hear the defense's alibi, go double check that video. And if they're not sure, maybe just remove it. If the defense can't poke holes in any of the other locations they have the car or the phone, I don't know. Nick said it is very interesting that Koberger's alibi is using the same kind of evidence the investigators claim they used to find him. Exactly right, Nick. A cell phone expert who is going to plot his points of his car based on his cell phone and pinging in the towers, which is exactly a huge part and very important evidence for the state against Brian Koberger. Now, this is what they have, okay? And 
what they have here from their expert to plot out these points. Where was his cell phone? He wasn't in this video. His car was at this location. I'm not so sure that provides the context that he liked to hike and run and explored Wawawai Park. And it was his favorite location. And he loved to look up at the moon and the stars. I still have a hard time understanding how they're going to prove this without Koberger testifying. And Anna said, Ann Taylor said he will testify. I would be absolutely shocked if Ann Taylor has already confirmed that he's going to testify, number one. It just would make no sense from a leverage point of view at this point or a trial strategy point of view for her to let everybody know he's going to testify, number one. Number two, that doesn't mean he has to testify. He can decide not to at any point up until he does testify. Once you start testifying and you waive that right, you can't say, all right, I'm not going to testify for cross. But up until that point, even if he says, I'm going to testify right now, he can still say, I'm not going to testify in the future. Love dropping 50 lawyer, you know, memberships. That is awesome. That's awesome. Love the members and everybody who is one. All right. Guess what? Is this all? Are they done? Are we putting a fork in the alibi? Can we just say, this is it, signed, sealed, delivered? We don't have to talk about alibi, alibi anymore. We know exactly what the defense is going to argue. We know what the corroboration is. Finally, they have you know put a bow on this. And the answer to that is no. Additional information as to Mr. Koberger's whereabouts as the early morning hours progressed, including additional analysis by Mr. Ray, will be provided. So more is coming. We are not done. More analysis, more info, more potential proof of his alibi will be provided. When? Once the state provides the discovery requested and now subject to an upcoming motion to compel. Okay? So don't read ahead because we've got more juice coming. But first right here. So once again, we talked about in August how they had all this information. So now hopefully we get more details based on what they had. They had time to analyze more discovery, grand jury testimony, all that. But that they were still having to file a motion to compel and force court orders to get discovery. Guess what? Almost a year later, the defense is making the same argument. Are they right? Are they telling the truth? I don't know. But we know they've won plenty of motions, of compel, motions to compel. Discovery they've requested that the state denied and the court ended up ordering the state to turn it over. Is that happening again? Is that creating delays? Because if it is, the judge isn't going to have a choice but to continue to continue this trial. So the state needs to turn it over so the defense can do their job. But those are some of the questions I had, right? So the first question is, is there a specific witness? Answer is no. Still no specific eyewitness as to where he is. Did they get an expert to analyze data? Yes. And now we know what the expert's going to testify to to his whereabouts, his habits, how often he did it, when he did it, why he did it. Somehow, I don't know how he's going to explain why he did it. But they have an expert. And then motions to compel discovery that they're planning to use for their alibi defense, that is still ongoing. Still ongoing. Almost a year after that original alibi. Get your questions in because we're almost done reading and I want to go through as many questions as I can. Fiona, thank you for gifting some memberships. So whatever questions you guys have about the alibi and where we go from here, throw them in the chat now and John will star some of them. So here's this last sentence that I found very interesting. If not disclosed, meaning if they don't turn over this discovery that we're asking for, Mr. Ray's testimony will also reveal that critical exculpatory evidence further corroborating Mr. Koberger's alibi was either not preserved, or has been withheld. So this is a bit of a threatening sentence here in a couple ways. First off, I'm not going to say they're threatening the judge, okay? I'm not going to say that. But if the judge does not force the state to turn this stuff over or allows the state, as we've seen in the past, say to Mr. Koberger, it doesn't exist, and then later they're like, oopsie, yes, it does exist, here it is. But if the judge is going to allow the state, which sometimes the judge's hands are tied, if the state says it doesn't exist, well, what am I supposed to do, Mr. Taylor? Tell them to create it? If it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. Well, she's throwing the warning shot out here that if you guys say this doesn't exist, our expert's going to call BS on that and say it does exist. It did exist. 
but you failed to preserve it. You dropped the ball or you have it and you're withholding it. You're covering something up. You're not giving us all the fair discovery that we deserve. And our expert's going to be able to testify to that. How? Because phones store X, Y, Z. And if you had the phone, you should have gotten Y. You got X and Z, but you didn't get Y probably because it's bad for you. And it's critical exculpatory evidence, as she says in this sentence. So it's definitely a warning shot at the state saying you better turn it over because the court's either going to order you to turn it over or we're going to say you had it or should have had it and now you don't and that's on you and potentially they're going to ask the court for some kind of negative inference to the state. Like why didn't you have the rest of his plotted points on the days where you, I'm just making this up, right? We don't know exactly what she's talking about. There's some cryptic nature to this, but on the days you're going to argue Brian was casing the joint or stalking them or whatever, why don't you have the plots for the rest of the day to see that he actually went to Wawawai Park, to see that he actually went to places where the moon and stars are more easily visible? It's a good question. Vicky with an I, yep. Everybody don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Maria, what evidence do they have besides the suspect DNA? I mean, they have a lot of evidence, but there's also a lot of things under seal. So when the trial starts, we'll actually see everything. But apparently they have his whereabouts with his car based on um, CCTV footage, video footage, like from cannabis stores and things like that. They have uh, uh, circumstantial evidence about him potentially turning off his phone during certain hours. They have, you know, the DNA sheath. They have that his car took this very weird route back home. So they have a lot of circumstantial evidence in addition to the DNA evidence, but we're going to see exactly how it all gets put together when it comes out of trial, because I think a lot of this is sealed and we don't know a lot of what evidence they have at this point. Mercy cat. When will the prosecution get sanctioned for withholding discovery? So both sides have been pretty cordial with each other, even in court, even when it's gotten heated, they're not blaming each other for a lot of this. And we have found out that Part of the reason for the delayed discovery or saying that something doesn't exist and then, oh, wait, it actually does is actually the fault of the FBI. So it's hard to sanction the prosecutor if they're doing everything they can. Amy Z, seems shady to me that they need discovery to come up with an alibi. Shouldn't he know what he was doing? So I understand this completely. And this is actually a common theme of people writing in about this alibi. And I get it. I get it, and I understand why it looks like he's creating an alibi or constructing an alibi, things like that. But if you look at what his alibi is, and he says he was out driving around alone at night, okay, that's the alibi. But to get some of the corroborating evidence, which they have partially here, I can understand why they would need some of the state's discovery. Because if you can disprove some of the state's evidence, like here is him on video at this cannabis shop, which is on the way to the victim's house. And you could say, actually, to corroborate his alibi that he wasn't on his way to the victim's house, we have a different plot point for where he was when you say he was at near the cannabis store. So seeing where some of the state's evidence is and poking holes in that can be part of the corroborating evidence of your alibi. Why is the defense allowed to spend so much money? Isn't this a great question? Especially when we see some other cases that don't get near the resources. And the question, my answer to that is I don't know because they requested it and they got it because Ann Taylor is choosing to ask for and has been allowed to spend basically all of her time and resources on this case. Carol, I don't know. Obviously it's a high profile case. It's a death penalty case. A younger man's life is on the line. So I get all of the reasons why it might be important. The state's throwing a lot of resources at it, but there's a lot of important cases that don't get this much, don't get as much resources. I don't understand why he hasn't presented his alibi. If he has one, why wouldn't he? So he did. Here it is. Randy. So with this alibi, will he have to testify? So here's another interesting part of the alibi, right? Just because he's stating this is his alibi doesn't mean that they have to argue it at trial. It doesn't mean he has to say, members of the jury, here is my alibi. This is what I was doing. It doesn't have to be that formal. And he can just poke holes or say the state didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt 
or say the investigation was flawed or say this was actually the person that did it, third party culprit argument. So he doesn't have to testify. I just, like Netwoman said, find it hard to believe with this specific alibi, how he really creates the context around it without testifying. Tiffany, how can this be an alibi? Don't you have to have a witness or something to back up an alibi? So no, the alibi is just where you were to prove you weren't where they say you were, right? That you weren't committing the crime. And sometimes you're alone. That's the other thing is like, I get people rolling their eyes at it. I get people thinking that this is not real, but like I drive alone sometimes. Now, usually not without my cell phone and where nobody knows where I'm at, but I'm not a single guy, right? I got multiple people that know where I'm at at all times. But as a single college guy, there were times I would drive around, probably nobody knew where I was. And, you know, with probably a more similar car to what he's driving then than what I have now, which is very easily trackable. But I, I, you know, going to look at the stars, I mean, people are like that. There are people like that. I think that this is like not the wildest thing in the world. But I also think it's very convenient that you're by yourself and I understand all the arguments against it. Absolutely. Annie K, question. Was an alibi required? We don't see alibis ahead of time in many trials. So yeah, and in different states, it's different different um, rules, but yes, in Idaho, they do require something like this that they file. Maria said the park is closed at night. Well, isn't that interesting? Closed like, because there are some closed parks you can still drive out to, right? And maybe just that area is where you like to drive out to, not necessarily get out and go into the park, but interesting discussion point, I think. Uh, Lahaina Noel said, I heard Nikolai Mew is currently making a shiv in prison too. Definitely too soon. Definitely too soon. But since you brought him up, a couple jurors have made statements in his case. They want to remain anonymous, but they made some statements and we know when his sentencing is there's a video dropping tonight at 9 PM. You don't want to miss it. Anybody that followed that Nikolai Mew, that Apple river stabbing trial, make sure you show up at nine o'clock tonight for the video and get in the chat because it was really interesting. And I've already recorded it. So I know, I know everything that came into it. So it was, it was really interesting. Lindsay, well, do we know what the data showed? Was the device off or was it off the cell network? I think the state's going to argue it was off. And I'm just looking at this and thinking, what could the defense have from this um, information that the expert analyzed? And do they have proof that the phone was on and it looks like or appears to be off. Is their expert going to say, and again, I don't know. This is what we have experts for as lawyers, but can their expert testify that, well, when you drive out of range or to certain parks or to the countryside or to view the moon and stars, which I hear is beautiful in Idaho. If you do that, sometimes it can look like your phone is off or does it actually show the phone powering off? Those will be questions for the expert. JB, what's up, man? Hey, Peter. Hashtag, hey, Peter. Hashtag, hey, JB. Uh, and hey, chat, great insight as always, Peter. Can't help but feel we're all going to learn a lot about the accuracy of the cell tower tech during the trial. Well, JB, here's the interesting part about the, the cell tower tech because it's it's been used in tons of trials. And when you say find out about the accuracy, my response to that will be, how accurate does the jury think it is? Because everybody will basically testify there's a cone. We don't know exactly where you are in the cone. And it could actually beep after you've already passed through the cone. And it can actually, sometimes I've heard experts testify that it can be one tower to another tower. So you can actually be beeping to that tower, pinging to that. I mean, it's pretty wild. I'm not saying it's not accurate. I definitely think it's helpful, especially when you have, like there's case, I think YNW Melly, they talked about it a lot where it's like he pinged this one, this one, this one, this one, this down the line. And it makes the perfect line to where they said he went. So that obviously that corroboration obviously helps it become more reliable. But if both sides are going to have their own experts, both saying that same evidence says two different things, that's really where it becomes interesting. And what I think is going to be interesting about this is the accuracy and all of the actual evidence that we're going to find out about when we actually go to trial. That's what I don't think we really know about. And that's what I'm really looking forward to seeing what is actually going to come out. What does the state have? And what does the defense have that they are And people, people were asking in the last hearing, Ann Taylor said, we believe he's, or I don't know if it's Ann Taylor, defense attorney said, we believe he's innocent. He didn't do this. We believe Brian. What's making him say that? Are we going to hear it as just the lack of evidence the state has? 
that would be not guilty or they can't prove it. But to prove he's or to believe he's innocent, do they have something that proves that in their minds? And people say, is that just posturing by defense attorneys? Sure, it can. And I think this defense team has made it known that they are very aware of the media presence and the attention on this case and trying to not lose the case in trial by media before it even starts. Maybe them saying he's innocent will help that. I don't know. But we have seen a lot of cases and a lot of defense attorneys don't say stuff like that. They don't say they believe their client's innocent. They don't really go that far, that extra mile, whether they believe it or not. Michelle, if they know his whereabouts, then why is he not out on bail with size info? With it? Will Anne try to get him released pending trial? No, that ship has sailed. That's not going to happen. And again, I think there's disagreement about what this evidence shows and who whose expert is right. Alyssa, why the defense plead silently? If the lawyer enters a not guilty plea, if she knows he's guilty, is that perjury? No, it's not perjury. Um, it's a very weird system and people plead not guilty all the time, even though they know later they might plead guilty because of the way our system works. Um, I don't know why it's like that procedurally. That's how it's worked. You plead not guilty. Then you can go work out a deal. If you plead guilty right there, sometimes you can't work out a deal and you got to get sentenced within so many days. So there's all sorts of issues sometimes in our system with that. So no, definitely not committing perjury. And again, we still don't fully know why I did a whole video on it when he did plead silently about what it could be and what changes it might make. Make If you want the deep dive, go check out that video. Allison, question, how come it is so difficult sometimes to make police, FBI, et cetera, discover or over, do they have to obey the court for delays? So state cops, yes, it's much easier. They're much more scared of the court. FBI, I've had trials in federal court where FBI agents are like, hey, uh, all you guys have to get out of the room, including you defendant, including you defense attorney. We, myself and the United States attorney have talked to the judge. We're like, what? What about the defendant's rights? They're like national security, sorry. Sometimes there's nothing we can do. So they can big league sometimes, and it's hard for state court to have a lot of jurisdiction to really punish or sanction the federal uh, government or the FBI. Tara, during his arrest, he asked if anyone else had been arrested. That info is never mentioned but now he had been with, but now he had been with someone. I don't know. I don't know if he had been with someone. And again, I don't know how those comments are going to come out and play. There's a lot we don't know. And that's, I'm looking forward to seeing if the defense does point to some third party or somebody that maybe I would think if he was with somebody that could corroborate, he wasn't there. It'd be part of his alibi defense. And now that that doesn't exist, I think we can confidently say he wasn't with somebody else and thinking that some other innocent person also got arrested with him because they drove by the house or something. Fletcher boy, the FBI took data from Leticia Stock's vehicle that filled gaps in the phone data. Yep. Yeah, there's definitely ways that it can become more reliable that experts should be able to put together. Mama Bear, so he needs to prove innocence, not the state proving guilt. Absolutely not. He does not need to prove his innocence. And hold on one second. Sorry, I accidentally unstart a question. Um, he, the state absolutely has to prove his guilt. But if he is going to have an alibi, he can't spring it on the state. He has to let the state know if there's discovery they need to do to disprove it, things like that. Certain jurisdictions do force things like this, and that's all this is. Uh, G of Twins. Closed at 8 p.m., opens at 7 a.m. There is an attendant at the entrance to collect the fee or pass to get in. I get it. I get it. So is it? I don't know what this park is. Is it not something you can just drive by and see the sky or you know take it in from your car? I don't know. Triple B. So most everything that's tying Brian Koberger to this case was just a coincidence slash bad luck. Is this a somewhat of a typical alibi? Sleeping alone at my house, I mean, is a more typical alibi than driving alone at night to look at the stars. I definitely think, you know, sleeping alone is a more common alibi um, or I was alone at my house watching TV or something like that. Um, that's a more common alibi. So I don't know if I say it's common, but it's not uncommon to be by yourself, especially as a single college guy or post-college guy, a grad student who's also a teacher, or TA. Um, I think it's more than coincidence and bad luck, but again, a lot is still to be determined until to be seen at trial. Okay. I wanted to, to play this before we left just to show you how, what the media thinks of this alibi and how I believe this is going to be portrayed here in the days coming. And judging from the chat, maybe you guys will have no problem with it. Maybe you guys will agree, and that's fine. It's your prerogative to agree. I just think it's interesting that 
when we're talking about a case, we're trying to, you know, presume him innocent. We're trying not to convict him in the court of public opinion. We're trying to not try the case before it actually gets a trial because there's so much we don't know. So I don't want to presume he's guilty, right? But listen to how she uh, kind of rolls her eyes with her words when discussing the newest alibi that they have quoted, the moon and stars. So if I asked my teenager where he was last night, and he said to me, I was out driving around alone all night with my phone switched off. Didn't interact with a single person. Let's just say it would- If you're driving around alone that late at night, are you interacting with a lot of people? I mean, sometimes I wake up, actually, this is a horrible example. As I'm giving my example, I'm realizing I'm, I'm disproving the point I'm making. I wake up at like 3 a.m. sometimes, can't fall asleep and I have a million things on my mind, like gotta do this, gotta do that. And I almost always either email myself, email a staff member or somebody, and they always the next day are like, why were you up at 3 a.m. and sending this email or whatever when they get up the next morning? So maybe that's a bad example because I actually do. But I can understand why you're not communicating with people late at night or early in the morning. But let's continue. It would be the beginning of our conversation. It would not be the end of it. Let's just say it would be the beginning of our conversation. It would not be the end of it. But that's exactly what Brian Koberger told an Idaho court tonight by way of an alibi for the murders of four university students in their off-campus house. And I'm going to read you word for word some of the latest filing, but I want to get Richard. I'm going to read you word for word, like literally word for word. She said she's going to read it and kind of laugh at it. Oh, I don't think she read it, but that was basically it. I mean, the sarcasm, the eye rolling, the moon and stars, how, yeah, right, he could be driving around by himself, not talking to anybody, how um, we're going to even read how they put it out. Can't believe he said he's out there looking at the moon and stars. I don't know. I don't think that we should just automatically say it's not true. I think it's absolutely perfectly fine to say well, if the state can prove that that's not true, well, now you start to get in trouble if that's something you're going to present in evidence. Just like we saw in the Nikolai Mew case. You say something as a defendant and it's not true, that hurts you. That's how it should be. But at this point, I don't know. Could be true, Could especially if it fits in with the state's evidence. It definitely could be true or it could be him creating an excuse that conveniently fits into the state's evidence and the state can argue that to a jury and it's very difficult as jurors to know what you're going to do until you're presented with it. And you're in that um, spot where you've got to make the decision. But it's up to the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was not just out driving alone, right? They have to prove exactly where he was, when he was there, and what he was doing when he was at 1122 Kings Road. Because just proving he drove through, just proving he drove by is not enough. The cell phone data or the car on some videos, that's not enough. Which is why the DNA is so important. The knife sheath is so important. Was he inside? Was he the person that actually did this? That's the question. That's the real question. And if so, how did he get rid of all the evidence? The state has to prove that. The state's going to have to fill in the gaps because one of the jury instructions in every criminal case is you can find reasonable doubt by a lack of evidence or inconsistencies in the evidence. So to say that somebody did this gory deed and they couldn't find a drop of blood in the car or any of the clothes, or they know exactly where his car drove, they know exactly they can map it out for you, but they never found the weapon. They searched his house, they searched his office, and they never found the weapon. So, I mean, that's the point. The state has to prove it. And the alibi, on its face, I'll just say, on its face, it is not just blatantly false and easily disprovable. That's what I'll say. That's what I'm confident saying. If they would have said he was in his bed at his house with his family, well, that should be easy to prove or disprove, right? This is not. So at least it's there. But I get why you guys are saying, like, it's too convenient how it fits. I get it. I get it. And I'm open to that as well. Art and Gray said, you always make me think I was biased before listening to this. I mean, that's fine. And that's kind of the point is your first thought is fine, but then check yourself and think, well, wait, if I look at it from the other side, let's see what happens. And guess what? The state could come with some great evidence, blow it out of the water. And you're like, boom, I was right. But at least I know 
I weighed the options appropriately. Somebody came up to me the other day and said, you know what I love about watching your channel is I always feel like I do have to come to my own conclusion. You don't just tell me which way to go. That's no fun. That's boring. And I could be wrong. So I like to give a lot of details, try to explain how certain things work that people might not know. And I love to hear from you how you get to the answer you get to. Uh, LR, question. So this will go to trial regardless of whether they have proof he was elsewhere. I certainly think it's all tracking towards a case that goes to trial. Mercy Cat, what are your thoughts on the ABA's stats on number of innocent people in prison and death row? So my, my thoughts on this are one person is too many. I hate to think that that happens. Um, but I know, I know personally people that maintain their innocence and still take plea deals because the risk is too great. So there's just so many difficult parts of our system and lawyers, we really work to try to fix it and make it the best we can, but it's an imperfect system. We're imperfect human beings. We learn from our mistakes, um, but hopefully we're continuing to improve and make it a better place and a better system. But I hate it. It's agonizing for, to me to think about, which is why, regardless of how heinous the crime is, I always try to think about that first. Look at this person as innocent. That's what the presumption of innocent means. Look at Brian Koberger as if he's innocent. And if he's innocent and we know he's innocent, how would we want the system to treat him? We would want them to have to build the perfect case to get rid of all reasonable doubts to change our mind from innocent to guilty. That's what I want when I look at every criminal case. Sherry, question. Uh, where you turn back to that park or go start to Moscow, there is a light that should show if he went start or turn to the state park and he was at, it should show which way he went. So you're saying there's a, there should be like a red light camera that shows that he turned left or right. Sure. I hope they have that. And I hope that that's what we get to see to connect all these dots. Now, depending on how long they took to figure out that he was a suspect, some of those red light cameras purge and re-record every 24 hours. Sometimes they save them somewhere else. So hopefully they got all that information. Vicky, hard to look at the moon and stars while driving. I agree, but can park and look at them. I don't know. I don't do that, but I'm, I, I think some people could. Stephanie, he's very cagey. He probably left his phone in well, why park went, did the crime and then went back to the park to create an alibi. It's possible, but you'd think they'd have cameras connecting him, leaving and going back. Right. Cause I thought he took a very different path on the way home. Very different path on the way home, but we'll see. We'll see. All right. I appreciate you guys so much joining me for all of these videos. Please hit that like button before you bounce and make sure you come back, subscribe, hit the reminder bell, come back tonight at nine o'clock um, for our night cap that we have. Um, I, I really appreciate everybody that adds their comments, adds their questions on this channel. They really add so much to the content as always. And this video was no different. So I appreciate you all. But until next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.